I mentioned a couple of times this morning about cleaning up things and calling it an archaeological dig. Well, I found this. It's dated October the 2nd, 1966, to my old Church of Christ. And it's a sermon I preached then. I think I'd been preaching about a year and a half at that time. I was about to be 20 years old. And so I was about, to, I thought I'd look at this. I wonder if I still preach it nearly 76 years old. But the truth is the truth. It's the truth and always will be the truth, regardless of the passing of the years or anything else. So I decided that I would preach this to you. When you see the Jews' view of Jesus, they had such a prejudiced, ignorant, means lack of knowledge, view of Christ, of his kingdom, of themselves and why they were on the earth, of the law of Moses. They misunderstood Christ. Now, they had a lot of things wrong with them. They were many of them dishonest. They weren't interested in doing all what God wanted them to do. They had convinced themselves that because we are by the flesh sons of Abraham through Jacob, everything's all right. But nevertheless, they misunderstood. They did not understand Christ as they should have. And you can think of a lot of things in your life that you thought at one point might have been the right thing. Then you came to find out, well, you'd misunderstood the directions. Or you'd misunderstood something else. And thus you turn to embrace whatever the right thing was in the matter. So one of the reasons Christ was rejected was people misunderstood him. And the same thing's true today. People don't understand Jesus as the New Testament pictures him. Of course, one of the chief reasons is they just don't read their Bible to know what God said. And yet that's the reason the Bible's here, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. For those who have a Bible, they misunderstand it because they don't understand what Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, uh, 2 and verse 15. As you study it, giving the proper diligence to the study of God's Word and all that that means, that you don't handle it correctly. They're just as apt to go to the book of Exodus and the Old Testament and well, say, what must I be sa do to be saved today? If they even have that much understanding that they should ask that question. Well, you're not going to find in the book of Exodus, nor any other book in the Old Testament, what Jesus teaches one must believe and do to be saved from your sins. And it might seem strange, but a whole host of people don't really make a difference between the Old and New Testaments. It may be second nature to you because of your teaching and because of being brought up having heard it. And we start that even with the little ones singing about 39 books in the Old Testament. 27 in the new. We sing the little song, old and new. Old and new. We learn from the old. We're saved by the new. We hear emphasize constantly that Christ has all power or authority in heaven and on earth. And all those things. We learn about the different uh, ages in which God has dealt with man. About the patriarchal age, the father rule period. Whereby he dealt with all men on the earth. Not through a written covenant, but by the work through the patriarchs, the father who acted as prophet, priest, and king, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. Then the law of Moses and all it had, specifically Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, concerning the law given to Israel and only to Israel. It was never meant to be a permanent thing. It was a law, schoolmaster, to bring them unto Christ, Paul says, Galatians 3, verse 24. But you don't, if you don't know those things, then you're going to misunderstand Christ and, and, and his way of salvation. You won't know what the gospel is. You may be wandering around over in Habakkuk trying to figure out how to worship God. Well, you're not going to learn that because we're under the Christian dispensation. Colossians 2.14 makes it very clear that the handwriting of ordinances, that is the law of Moses, was nailed to the cross. 
And you would think people would think more about that. They'll try to do various things and cite the Old Testament, but they will not be consistent and do all the things the Old Testament said. They don't sacrifice lambs and pigeons and goats and so forth. And they don't go up to a temple. And if they wanted to go up to the temple in Jerusalem, it wouldn't be there because it's not. And there's no way that even if you are a Jew by blood, as pure as it could be back to Jacob through Abraham or to Abraham, you couldn't worship God according to the law of Moses. It's an impossibility to do so today. You'd have to know, first of all, the priestly tribe, and nobody knows what tribe they're from. But we are under authority to Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him, John 14, 6. But again, those things are misunderstood. And thus, they misunderstand Christ. When it comes to the matter of Christ praying on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They, don't, they didn't comprehend what they were doing. And so out of ignorance, they did those things. Paul even wrote talking about, I would not have you ignorant, brethren. We joke about that sometimes. says, I wouldn't have you ignorant, brethren. But that's not the way it's punctuated. Ignorant means lack of knowledge. I got in trouble long years ago and sort of because one of the men in the church didn't like me referring to these verses in the New Testament. It says, I would not have you ignorant. So, ignorant to him, I think, was sort of a swear word or something. And I said, well, all ignorance means you don't know. That's all it means. And if you'd rather me say you don't know, I'll say that rather than call you ignorant. But the fact of the matter is all of us are ignorant about a lot of things. So we don't need to be ignorant about the truth of God's word and how to study it to ascertain the authority of our Lord to save us since he is the way, the truth, and the life. But that's the case. And if you misunderstand my actions and if you misunderstand my words and if you misunderstand my aims and purposes, if you misunderstand my motives and even my last will and testament, then you surely have misunderstood me. Now apply that to the New Testament of Christ. And if you don't know how to write and divide it or handle it right, then you're not going to understand the things you need to in order to become a true Christian. So the Son of God is misunderstood in every one of those things I just mentioned. Of course, there are those who will not even try to understand. They've got their mind made up. Don't confuse me with the facts. Well, that's a trite saying, but that's true. People just won't try to understand. They're given the ability to understand, and they may increase in great knowledge in certain areas having to do with this life. It takes a great deal of work on their part, regardless of their high IQ or whatever, and they really put their shoulder to the grindstone and put forth the necessary mental efforts to learn things. But they don't care about the Bible and God's Word. The philosopher Goethe had this to say, Misunderstanding and inattention create more uneasiness in the world than deception and artifice. Or at least their consequences are more universal. There was a story told of a fellow one time who had been hired to work on a given machine in a factory that produced whatever it does make any difference. And so the, he was shown how to do it and said, now if you run into a problem, first thing you do, the foreman said, is call me. And he started down and for a while everything went all right and he had a problem and he kept trying to deal with it and made things worse and finally tore off the machine when the foreman came around. He said, what happened? He said, well, I had a problem and I thought I could keep on and fix it. He said, didn't I tell you that the very first thing to do when you had a problem was call for me? Well, uh, he either didn't believe what the foreman said or she didn't really understand him when he said it and what it meant. What we're talking about here has caused uh, many divorces. It's caused all sorts of parting of friends, created all kinds of uproars and riots and all this kind of thing. That's happening all the time. We used to, uh, 
because people knew more about firearms and the way that the old firearms worked. We talked about people going off, going off half cocked. Well, of course, on those pistols, you'd have a half cocked position so it wouldn't go off. It wouldn't be pulled all the way back. Well, you're not going to get much done out of it when it's half cocked because the trigger won't pull. <laughs> and if you're expecting to shoot something, then you better have it full cocked. Well, there's a lot of us like that in the things that we do. Thus, the old writer Hosea said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. By the way, I could say and be just as right as reading it that way, my people are destroyed for ignorance. <laughs> so uh, I guess we need to understand that all we can do is study to remind ourselves of what we already learned and then study to know more. We don't want these things to happen. I remember one time the situation back at one congregation. There was a man and woman who was upset over something. I was meeting with the elders and with another man who was involved in it. And they brought up, and I don't even remember now the specifics of what it was, but it's what they were upset with, and they were accusing somebody of something, and it turned out the fellow didn't even know what they were talking about. They had just heard the grapevine or some vine that uh, this fellow was guilty of something they thought wasn't right, and so they were all upset with it, and they didn't know what to do and when they found out the fellow had no idea what they were talking about. Well, that may seem terrible, but it's caused all kinds of problems among brethren through the years, and all sorts of on the workplace and every other way. So we need to exert every effort to be understanding and try to be understood. Every effort to be understanding, that means of others, and that we do what we can to be understood in expressing ourselves. So the greatest havoc of all misunderstanding is misunderstanding Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We cannot ask, but ask the question, why? Well, one of the big reasons that I've already pointed out, really, we should know the answer to that is because he wasn't understood. Remember, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. They had had at least 1,500 years under a law that was designed to bring them to Christ. They still didn't understand it. That didn't mean all didn't, but most didn't. So in what ways is Christ misunderstood? Well, we won't cover all of them, but we'll cover some. And we've already mentioned the fact that his word is misunderstood. People won't realize that the New Testament is our Lord's last will and testament. He's ruling at the right hand of God in heaven. There hasn't been any revelation from him in almost 2,000 years. The canon, if you please, of scripture, of sacred writ is closed. So we have the Bible. We have the Word of God. There must be proper awe and respect on our part of this being the revelation of the mind of God to us. This wasn't written to some jaybird sitting up on a limb. It wasn't written to your pet dog or cat. It wasn't written to anything like that. It wasn't written in the care of elephant ears or plant or anything. Else. It was written to human beings. Because we have a spirit in us fathered by God that must someday stand before Jesus Christ, the judgment seat of Christ, to give an account of the deeds done in the body. You remember that Jesus stated to his disciples, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Have you ever noticed right after that that Peter asked the Lord to explain that? Do you have any problem having heard it? It may be because of your background knowledge of the scriptures or heard other lessons that's explained it to you, but Peter had to have that explained. And the Lord hit them with like he did many times if you'll study his method of teaching. He said, are ye also yet without understanding? Matthew 15, 13 through 16. In other words, I'm saying these things so you will understand, and, but you don't. And after Jesus had plainly declared the details of his approaching death, did his disciples understand? And the answer is no, they didn't. 
in Luke 18, 31 through 34, and they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. Do you ever notice those passages? Or we read through those too fast to get the meaning of them. I'm just glad that the Lord chose those apostles and he had that kind of long-suffering attitude toward them that he's still the same Jesus toward us. This is one reason that we need to constantly expose ourselves to the truth over and over again. In John chapter 8, verses 43 through 44, I've already mentioned the Jews, but particularly we zero in on this sect of the Jews that was the strictest sect of the Jews, the Pharisees. They understood even less. Jesus asked them one time, Why do you not understand my speech? That's interesting. Think about that. Jesus is the incarnate Word. Think about that. Word. And here he is speaking to them and asking them, why don't, you, why don't you understand what I'm saying? Because you cannot hear, he says, my word. That's strange. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. They had erected barriers, prejudices, preconceived notions and ideas. And it's like sitting at the end of a dramatic presentational stage and the curtain comes due or comes down and you can't see anything back there well each one of us can do that toward the pure truth of the gospel and we won't understand it they didn't care to understand and obey they had their own plans their own desires their own views and everything had to fit into that there can be willful <coughs> misunderstanding or failure to understand because of uh, inattention. That's going to condemn a lot of folks. Well, I didn't know that. Well, it was said. It was taught. You're exposed to it day in and day out, but you didn't get it. Listen to Jesus. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears they have are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Why? What, what, what have they done? He says, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them, Matthew 13, 15. You know, God created us in such a way that to be contacted. We usually call those our five senses. Seeing, smelling, tasting, hearing, touching. If you don't have any of those senses working, you can't be in contact with anybody and they can't be in contact with you. God hasn't bypassed those things to contact us so he can get to the inner man that is taught, educated in spiritual things by the word by those vehicles of thought traveling from God to inspired writers to us. So we're to study it. We're taught as preachers to preach the word, the gospel. It's the seed of the kingdom. It's the sword of the spirit. But we can so mess up ourselves that we, we don't understand. Because we're going to tenaciously hold one thing. That's what my Ten folks who believe, my parents, my grandparents, and everybody else. And uh, they were good people. We ought to let the Bible define who's a good person. We ought to remember that, first of all. But it doesn't make any difference how morally good you are. If you're not in harmony with the teachings of the New Testament, heaven will not be your home. Morality alone just won't save anybody. There's many who misunderstand because... They just don't want to obey. They just won't. They read it. Intellectually, they understand it. They, they know such passages as Hebrews uh, 5 and uh, verse 10, that Christ is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. 
They know that's there. They're not dummies. They intellectually grasp it. They know what obedience is. They know it's submitting to whatever it is, is to the one that has authority to command them. Paul even wrote to those who had obeyed the gospel were Christians and encouraging them to be stronger and more faithful. He said, but God be thanked you were the servants of sin. It means slave to sin. But you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. You were then made free from sin. I go backwards in that. They were then made free from sin. What's the then when you obeyed from the heart? So if you don't believe you have to obey Christ to be saved, you might want to cut that out of your Bible and pretend it won't show up at the day of judgment if you're that determined not to obey what you know intellectually it says for you to do. Or it's like the people that was written about of Israel. Uh, they heard what God required of them under Moses as they were traveling. What good did it do them? It was not mixed in, with faith in them that heard it. They intellectually understood these things. You remember when uh, they erected the calf, Moses up on Mount Sinai. We, we don't know what's happened to this Moses that led us out of Egypt. Let's build this calf and give him the homage. Well, you say, how could they do that? Well, I don't get any more concerned about that for their culture and their times than I do people today who know just exactly the plain words of Jesus Christ in the New Testament that will confront them on the day of judgment and they go right ahead and do as they please. Listen to what Jesus said in John 7, verse 17. If any man, that doesn't leave anybody out. Man there means mankind. Will do his will. As far as I know, that means action on my part. And it's the Lord's will that's being put into practice in my life. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine or the teaching. Whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. That tells me something about the Word of God. It wasn't designed to accomplish anything with the person just by them intellectually understanding what the passage means. It is so designed is that you come to an understanding when you have the disposition of heart, a contrite and humble heart, that understands intellectually what this says, but then you obey it. If people aren't willing to obey the truth, they have erected uh, some sort of blinders up before them and that's the reason that Jesus quoted Isaiah and so did Paul at the end of Acts concerning the Jews when they had stopped their ears and wouldn't listen if you consider Herod the Great and him killing the children of Bethlehem he had a, of course, he was a very wicked person. We know that. Even secular history teaches that. But he had no idea of Christ's kingdom. He could only perceive of a kingdom like the one he had. And if you study his life, you'll see he was so jealous over the position of king, he killed his wife, killed his son, and everybody else. So what was a few children, babes in Bethlehem, if they were going to be a threat to him? But again, regardless of his wickedness and dishonesty of heart, it's because he misunderstood the nature of the kingdom. You see that with Jesus appearing before Pilate. My kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom were my soldiers, if you please, would rise up and they would fight for it. Because that's what the theocracy that was at fleshly Israel did among the nations of the world. As I said earlier, the Jews were looking for a material kingdom. And it caused problems even in the minds of the disciples who loved Jesus, wanted to follow him. In Luke 7, 20 through 21, and when, he was de and when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Now, immediately, they should have thought, that's different from the kingdom we know anything about. Then he said, neither shall they say, lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. See, Christ rules us by our acceptance of his will and our submission to his will. 
And when each one obeys the gospel, the Lord adds them to his church, the kingdom of Christ. And he rules us as we individually submit to the truth we know and we believe. They didn't understand that. Now you may say there's all sorts of reasons they didn't. Well, that's not the point. The point is they misunderstood it. And it still goes on today, people not understanding. You take anything about the church as it appears on the pages of the New Testament, whether it's the worship on the first day of the week as we studied about this morning, and people will say, well, I just don't see the use of that. Well, don't they realize they're saying it must suit me or I'm not going to do it? Well, I don't guess they do. Or they've been falsely led to believe just so I decide this to be acceptable to God. God's going to accept it. And that's just not the case. Well, looking at Christ further, our Lord's motives, his motives were understood. You remember that the Pharisees actually questioned his eating with publicans and with sinners. You must remember the publican was a tax collector, a tax collector for Rome, a Jew, and they thought that was terrible because they hated the Romans being there, much less a Jew who would actually work for them. And so many of them uh, not only took the tax that the Romans demanded, but took a little more to line their own pockets. And so they considered a publican to be a very bad person, along with others that they considered to be sinners. Here's why Jesus replied to them on these things. They that are whole, W-H-O-L-E, need not a physician or need no physician, but they that are sick, Matthew 9, 12. And he also said, I came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance, Luke 5, 32. Now he's answering them because of their criticism of him eating with publicans and sinners. He's not fellowshipping publicans and sinners in the very sins they committed. How are you going to teach a sinner of any kind if you don't have some sort of association that allows you to to teach, which obviously it would not be necessarily fellowshipping the sin. It's to get them out of sin, to get them to see what sin is and that they're guilty of it and to get them to come to know they need to change, they need to repent, they need to believe and obey the truth. His um, motives for feeding the multitude was misunderstood. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Jesus said, ye seek me not because ye saw miracles, because ye did eat loaves and were filled. Then he taught a lesson. Labor not for the meat, the food, the sustenance that perisheth. John 6, 26 through 27. Do you take time and understand that? You know what he's saying which says a lot of folks followed him just to go to the cafeteria. That's exactly what he said. It wasn't to learn the truth he taught. You must understand a lot of those people did good to have one meal a day. And that's what's interesting about him by a miracle multiplying the loaves and fishes on two separate occasions. But they came just to eat physical food. But he was offering spiritual food. John says, the Apostle John, of his miracles, our Lord's miracles, these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. John 20, verse 31. People will talk about miracles today. Some people think that miracles are still being done. Some people don't even know what a miracle is. You'll see a terrible car accident. The thing will be wadded up to where you wonder how on earth somebody ever got out of that. And in, at certain times and places and terrible collisions like that, somebody's actually walked away with hardly a scratch on them. And it's reported by the news people it was a miraculous escape. And that's not the way the Bible uses miraculous. <clears throat> a miracle is that which alters the natural course of things. It's like raising the dead. It's like causing a person to walk who was born crippled and never has walked. And it's instantaneous. 
It bypasses all laws of nature. So people don't understand. They confuse things. I remember old Roberts many years ago used to come on the air by saying, expect a miracle. And my thought in my mind every time I watched him was, and everybody else like him, expect a plea for a donation. Well, there's proper giving. The Bible teaches it. But again, people misunderstand that. They don't understand that. They just have to have a car wash to raise money for whatever religion they're in or a cake bake or some sort of whatever. That's not the way the Lord said raise funds for the church to operate, to be free will offerings. Now, just read the New Testament and believe the Lord knew what he was talking about. Because there are going to be folks at the judgment who said, Lord, did we not do this, that, and the other in thy name? And Jesus is going to say, I'm not going to argue with him. By the way, note that. There's no argumentation goes on. He says, depart from me, I never knew you. And therefore, the testament of the Lord is misunderstood. I've already mentioned that people think they can go back to the Old Testament. You see everybody clamoring around in recent years of saying, let's just put the Ten Commandments up here and there and the other. Well, there's nobody going to be able to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy like the Ten Commandments says because we're not under the authority of Moses. We're under the authority of Christ. People have so misunderstood that they've even called Sunday the Christian Sabbath. There's no such thing. There's a day that's special, but it's only special because we're to do something on that day that we're to do only on that day. And that's as simple as we have now and engaged in all the acts of worship as we studied this morning. So you're going to find that people are inconsistent. As I said earlier, they won't offer blood sacrifices, all that kind of thing, to say that's necessary to go to heaven. They won't do it. But they do pretty much what they want to. They like a cafeteria-type religion where I pick what I want and I leave what I don't. That's not the way it is. They fail to understand. If you don't get anything else out of this sermon, know that people reject Christ because, for one reason, they fail to understand what the Bible teaches and they will not do what's necessary to understand. Paul wrote in Colossians 2, 13 and 14, these are Christians, the church at Colossae, and you, being dead in your sins, the, uncirc the circumcision of your flesh hath he quickened he's made alive spiritually to gather with him having forgiven your trespasses forgiven you all your trespasses then he said it what I referred to at the beginning of the sermon blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us which is contrary to us and took it out of the way nailing it to his cross we're under the New Testament. If you want to know what to do to be saved, you will consult the, consult the words of Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, the New Testament, the last will and testament of Christ, and you'll study it. And you'll learn what to do. As Christ is giving the Great Commission, as Mark's account of it, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. There's no use telling unbelievers that they must be baptized if they won't believe. They must be brought through evidence of the scriptures to the conclusion that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the only begotten Son of God, the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father but by him, John 14, 6. Once they're fully convinced of that and have trust, faith, belief in the Christ as the only Savior, then the question rises, well, what does he tell me to do for him to save me from my sins? Well, that's believing to be baptized. Those on the day of Pentecost who had believed were taught that belief alone wasn't enough because when believe, as believers they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter, standing up with the other apostles, says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ 
for the remission of sins. Verse 41 says that then they that gladly received his word were baptized. Those people were added to the church, verse 41 and 42 and 47, and that's the same way it works today. That, beloved, is the way that is right and cannot be wrong. Now, that's what I want in my life. I don't want to wonder, well, I wonder if he'll accept this. I wonder if this is all right. You don't have to wonder. You can know that you're a Christian because you can know the truth. But if you don't know the truth, you're not going to understand Christ or anything about him. And yet, it's this New Testament, as we said in the beginning, that will be the standard of judgment on the day of judgment. And when you get to that stage, it's too late to believe and obey. Today is the day of salvation, and now is the accepted time. And Brother Ken, it seems to me that sermon still preaches as well as it did all those years ago. Because it's the truth. I think I know a lot more now than I did then. But it's still the truth. If you need to obey the gospel, now's the time to do it. Why resist what you know in your own mind is what the Bible says? Why do that? What good is that doing anybody? It's certainly not doing you any good. You still stand separated from God regardless of what you think. If you won't do what Christ said in the way he said it, then for the reason he said it. As a child of God, are you living faithful to him? Are you doing what the Bible says children of God ought to do in service and in worship? If there's an area of your life where it's not, repent of it. Confess those sins and pray God's forgiveness, for that's God's second law of pardon. Now, if you need to obey the gospel, what, what doth hinder you? Ask that question. What is standing between you and doing now what you know? Surely you understand what you know the Bible requires of you to become a Christian. So why you leave this building this afternoon not having obeyed the truth? So if you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.